Good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to this public event, uh, which is organized by the Department of Economics uh, here at the London School of Economics and Political uh, Science. My name is Michael Barzillet. I'm a professor of public management uh, in the Department of Management, uh, and I'm the host of this evening's uh, event. Um, I'm pleased to welcome the online uh, audience, as well as the audience here uh, in person in the Sheikh Zayed uh, Theater. I'd especially like to welcome our guest uh, speaker, Dr. Joe Zamat Lucia, author of the recently published uh, book titled, The New uh, uh, Political Capitalism. Uh, I can think of no better locale in which to be talking about the new political capitalism than the new academic building. Uh, I'd also like to point out the subtitle uh, of, the, of the book, uh, which is How Businesses and Societies Can Thrive in a Deeply Politicized World. This book has much to say about all of those issues, uh, as you'll come to appreciate through this evening's uh, discussion. The event is being recorded uh, and is to be made available as a podcast um, uh, on the presumption that no technical difficulties uh, ensue. Uh, for the Twitter uh, users, the hashtag for today's event is mysteriously LSE New Political Capitalism. Uh, the plan for this evening is twofold. Uh, the first part will be something of an interview conversation. Um, uh, with Joe, for which I have prepared some, uh, some questions. It's designed to help you be acquainted uh, with the book, enough so uh, that you can uh, participate with questions uh, and appreciate uh, the book as well. Uh, so after about 40 minutes of uh, the discussion, we'll have Q&A, um, and you'll have specific instructions, but they're the ones that uh, are standard for these kinds of events. Uh, if you're uh, participating uh, online, uh, you'll be able to submit your questions in uh, written form. As you do so, it's important that you indicate uh, your name and your affiliation. Uh, when it comes time to the, for the q and I'll try to go back and forth between the uh, audience here and the online uh, audience. And most importantly, after the event, there will be a book signing uh, opportunity uh, up there in the, on the lower ground floor. So I hope you'll do that. So before uh, beginning the conversation, I'd like to share a little background uh, on, our, uh, on our guest. Uh, Joe trained as a medical doctor uh, and practiced this profession, uh, first with the NHS and afterwards with the Royal uh, Air Force. Uh, thereafter, uh, he switched from medicine to business, so working in the pharmaceutical sector, and after that corporate experience, uh, founded a management consulting practice uh, that catered in large part to the pharma industry. And he led that for um, just over a decade. And after exiting uh, from that uh, through an acquisition, he's, his involvement's turned to policy and politics. He's specifically involved with the liberal, liberal Democrats uh, while they belong to the coalition government. Uh, more recently, he has been involved in leading a policy uh, think tank called Radix, whose mission uh, is to develop the uh, radical center. So this long and varied uh, professional trajectory has given Joe a kind of up close, close personal perspective on the developments uh, that are the subject of the new political capitalism, how businesses and societies can thrive in a deeply politicized world. So uh, we'll turn to the to the to the conversation. So welcome. Thank you. First Glad first. to be here, and thank you for coming, and thank you to the Department of Economics for hosting. First time at the LSE in this capacity. In this capacity, <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. That's good. So I just thought um, to get started to get a kind of picture of what sort of book this is in terms of the content, because it could be many things. So it could be. Um, kind of discover, reporting of discoveries of new facts about uh, business, about markets, about people, about organizations, about capitalism. Um, so, uh, or it could be that the information isn't really newly discovered, but it's presented in a new light. And another interpretation, maybe reflecting uh, Radix, is that it's a kind of political or policy statement. It doesn't have to be just one of these things, but 
Could you say what sort of the what sort of genre we're talking about for this book? Yeah. So um, I think you are questioning. You know, is this a science? Is it pedagogy? Is it a polemic? I, I see it primarily as a polemic. So I'm trying to raise questions and look at the world through a particular lens. Um, and as I say in the book, <clears throat> the aim is hopefully to raise a discussion about these issues, about how business fits as a political institution, looking at business as a political institution rather than as a financial institution. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's not intended to be scientific. Maybe I have a rather narrow view of science, but I find it difficult to, um, it's, it's, it's about a trend into the future. So it's, it's very difficult. I find it difficult to think of that as, as, as science. Um, but it's intended essentially to raise a debate. And, you know, one of my own, one of my many irritating features, I guess, is that I'm a compulsive contrarian. <laughs> so um, there's no statement that anybody can make that I won't find a way to argue with. Uh, so, so I was hoping to, to raise that discussion. Um, and if you look at the world through this framework, what does it look like? Do you agree with that? Do you have different views? Um, you asked whether it was a political statement. Well, to some extent, almost everything is a political statement. Um, you know, there isn't a statement in economics or finance or business strategy that does not have political content. Uh, and that, I guess, is essentially the subject of the book, that there is nothing you do in business that does not have political content. Okay, very good. So opens a debate. Uh, debate itself has uh, political content, if you wish. And, um, and I think we can get at maybe the nature of the uh, debate by trying to make uh, sense of the title. Okay. Um, uh, now you can't judge a book by its cover and everything, but a lot of work goes into coming up with the title. And so um, really the question is, what does this title signify? I mean, what would you like it to signify for people, for example, here or others who are reading uh, the book? And there are lots of different options here. It could be a trend, for example, or it could be um, uh, something different from that. But, you know, what, what do you want people to go out of the room say, you know what that title signified? <laughs> What's the answer? Well, my publisher has been it was spent a long time telling me that the objective of a title is to grab attention and sell books, not necessarily, not necessarily to reflect what's inside them. <laughs> but, but, but let's put let's put that to one side for the moment, and uh, and and so maybe talk through how the title came about. Um, so the, the motivation for the book was that throughout my life in the business field. There was this undercurrent that business, some, many maybe, business people wanted to see business as somehow being apolitical. Uh, that's nothing to do with us. And a kind of common statement that you get from many executives is, if only politics would get out of the way, we can just get on with the business of doing business. Um, <clears throat> and that never struck me as being real. Um, and I was chatting to a friend of mine who was a, 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 who's the chair of a big multinational company who said, you know, we really have difficulty understanding political rationality because it is so different from business rationality. So the book started out with trying to explain or explore the fact that business rationality is indeed fundamentally different from political rationality, and that's perfectly legitimate. And this is why it is different, and this is why it's legitimate. So the original you know, titles came up like business is political, well, it's not very exciting, <laughs> or the politics of business, that could mean very many different things. But as I was writing the book, which I wrote, which I wrote through lockdown, um, 
it seemed to me that it's not just that business has this important political content, but that the world was fundamentally changing. And the nature of the relationship between commerce and politics was entering a new phase. Um, that, you know, we'd, we'd been through a phase in the kind of 80s, 90s, where the window of political ideas, the, the, the breadth of political debate was really very narrow. You know, we had convinced ourselves that liberal democracy had won the battle of ideas, that, um, you know, neoclassical and economics and neoliberal ideology <clears throat> would solve the world's problems, that everybody was going to become democratic because the Soviet Union has, had fallen and China would obviously become democratic because that's the best thing. Um, and, you know, really the window of debate was very, very narrow. So business could be allowed to get on with the business of doing business and making money. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, we now know that all that is now shattered. The window of political ideas is very, very large. Um, there is huge contestation of almost every aspect of political debate. Um, and when that happens, political considerations will always take priority over commercial considerations. So it seemed to me we were entering a new phase of what capitalism means, uh, moving from you know, the phase that we've been in and are still in to large extent of financialized capitalism um, through what I thought I would call political capitalism. And the reason I have the new um, element is of course the, the phrase political capitalism in itself is not new, um, but in the past it's been used to describe or it's been interpreted as, a, as a, a situation where the elite in politics and business basically ran the system to their advantage. Uh, I believe that's now an outdated view of political capitalism because in these days we, with social media, with everything being much more transparent, with a much more active civil society, et cetera, et cetera, power is becoming more dispersed. So, you know, the new political capitalism is something I believe to be quite different from that which was previously described. So would you say that the, the title is meant to have a particular meaning for, meaning for people who are running big companies or not necessarily big companies. I mean, it's meant to be a thing for them or it's most it's supposed to be a thing for other actors in the society. I think it's a thing for everybody. I think it's, a, it's, it's a, a, another evolution in how capitalism works. Um, it's, you know, we, we've had all forms, uh, lots of forms of capitalism. I mean, that's why it's been resilient because it can adapt you know, from feudal times, we've had mercantile capitalism, industrial capitalism, uh, consumer capitalism, financialized capitalism. And I think that the new phase we are entering now, which I call political capitalism, is that the battle of political ideas, you know, there's issue from issues like climate change, environmental destruction, you know, uh, labor conditions in supply chains, you know, all sorts of issues that we kind of ignored or, or put in a box as externalities that we don't need to worry about are now central to how you run your business and how we all behave in, in, in this new environment. Um, from you know, big issues to you know, top to bottom, it affects businesses from whether the multinational model is still viable in the form it used to be down through whether you should have gender neutral bathrooms, you know, and everything in between. So you can imagine that the uh, business people, certain ones ad adopt this as their frame or perspective for the nature of their business and the environment they face, but also claimants on those businesses could evoke, uh, could, could say, you really need to talk about this because uh, even if you wouldn't have in the past, because it's a new era. Yes, to be used that way. So um, 
in the in the in the discussion of the book, there's quite a lot on uh, financialized capitalism that's taken to be the, you know, either the um, the dominant variant uh, at present or recently so. Um, it's kind of a negative model uh, for the new political capitalism as a political statement. So there's a kind of dialectic in the argument between the two, financialized capitalism and uh, new political capitalism. So it might be helpful to get clear for us uh, what's the difference, so to speak. Are there traits of the new financial capital, uh, new, the new political capitalism that are not traits <laughs> of financialized capitalism and vice versa? Where would you, how would you work out the demarcation between? The yeah, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, I think, you know, this is an evolutionary process. So nothing is in nice, neat boxes. Um, you know, we evolve from one form of capitalism to another. Um, some traits are retained, others get superseded, and, you know, things evolve and change, maybe over a generation or two generations. It's not kind of an overnight thing. Um, and the other thing I'd like to mention is that, of course, these things manifest themselves differently in different cultures and different and different countries. So the nature of political capitalism here in the UK is going to be different from the nature of political capitalism in China. <laughs> um, but in both, you know, political considerations are important. But let's take this idea of, you know, financialized capitalism. Uh, by which I understand a system where much economic activity takes place within the financial system itself, rather than in industry. So it's, I describe it, and many others have described it, this is not my definition, as when, you know, finance is supposed to be the lifeblood of the economy supposed to fund industrial development. Uh, that's how we've understood finance, mitigate risk over time, et cetera, et cetera. These are the, all the good, the good elements, the important elements of finance that, that we can't do without. Um, when the economy becomes financialized, trade and activity within, within the financial system becomes an end in itself. Um, so take an example of a company like Boeing. If you look at, if you look at the 7, 7, 737 MAX problems that they had that killed 600 people or whatever it was, um, <clears throat> what you find is that in a world of financialized capitalism, Boeing management preferred to use capital to engage in stock buybacks and other financial engineering uh, than to invest more in the 737 MAX development. If you look at stock markets now, if you look at the London stock market, more money has been taken out of the, the, the economy and the industrial world, taken out by the stock markets, than actually put in through dividends, <laughs> stock buybacks, etc. So it's it's to the extent it's the world upside down. Um, in and as, as somebody said about Boeing, you know, Boeing forgot that it was supposed to be in aircraft engineering and moved to being in financial engineering. So so those are the the disadvantages of financialization carried to an extreme. And that's, that's the situation that we have been in now for a while. Um, that is socially and culturally becoming less and less acceptable. Um, <clears throat> and the trade-offs are changing. So, you know, again, the difference between the management of financial way of thinking when Harley Davidson, when, when, when Donald, President Trump put steel tariffs on steel uh, in the United States, Harley Davidson, you know, an icon of American, uh, very American brand, said it was going to move some production outside of the United States. Perfectly rational business decision. When the Financial Times went to interview 
employees of Harley Davidson following this decision, um, employees who are going to lose their job and ask them, well, what do you think about all this? The response from the employees was, well, I know I might lose my job, but I think the president's decision was the right decision because we have to protect America. So here we are as a, a fundamental difference between the kind of management financial way of thinking and the political way of thinking, which is more visceral, more emotional. And management can no longer ignore that. Um, we're now operating in a fundamentally different world, um, which affects you know, industries top to bottom. I mean, the whole investment management industry now is driven by, by political considerations. You know, should we invest in things that prolong, that, that, that cause more climate change? You know, should we invest in companies that have slave labor in their supply chains? Should we invest in this, that, and the other? These are all political considerations that affect how a whole industry is behaving. So what would be then a traits of, uh, of the new political capitalism that you know, uh, would not be associated with where it came from? So in financial capitalism, everything is measured in dollars. Um, the only thing that matters on the balance sheet is you know, money in, money out. Um, and the unmeasurable, the thing that can't be converted into cash, into, into, into financial terms, sort of doesn't really matter. Um, I think if I can keep the, the analogy, if you like, of capital, I think in a world of political capitalism, businesses, corporations have to look at all the capitals that they utilize, create, or destroy. So there's financial capital, but there's also social capital, there's environmental capital, there's political capital, there's uh, human capital. So if you want to look at it holistically, in a politicized world, you have to create, you have to have a, a net positive in all those capitals. The idea of, you know, they don't matter. I can destroy environmental capital and convert it to shareholder value measured in dollars. You know, those days are coming to an end. We're, they're not at an end by any means, um, but it's more difficult to live in that world. Um, so when we talk about capital or when we teach finance or whatever, you know, it's no longer just financial capital. You know, how do you have a feel? And some of these things are not easily measurable, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, you have to have a feel as to whether your business activities, what is the impact on environmental capital? What's the impact on social capital? If I move my production from here to here and make 5,000 people redundant, you know, what's the social impact on that? What does that do to my social capital as a corporation? Um, if people are struggling in the world to, to pay their um, energy bills and, and you know, what's the impact of my political capital when I announce 5 billion of quarterly profits? Yeah. So you know, the, all these things affect how you run your business. And these are what I broadly call political considerations. And again, by politics, I don't mean the cut and thrust of, of electoral politics. I mean, the process by which we decide what kind of society, we collectively decide what kind of society we want to live in. That's my definition of politics. And nobody can absolve themselves from that, least of all business. Okay, so um, I think it would be interesting to get into what you take to be sort of mechanisms or practices or you know, rare events uh, that that kind of make this real, make it manifest, uh, drive it forward, whatever your favorite expression is. And uh, a couple of the chapters of the book are particularly concerned with that, you know, some case studies of individual uh, companies. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe help us see what are the practices and mechanisms that are making this, you know, real today? 
Sure. Um, and and that you know, you, in particular, ones you admire. Sure. So, um, the book was published <clears throat> in early February. About three weeks later, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> now, you know. There's no cause and effect there, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Let's <laughs> can do something. Um, but it it kind of it was an explosive um, demonstration. You know, following that invasion, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of Western companies left Russia. Right. Okay, so you know you can't get a more graphic demonstration of how a political event drove business behavior, okay? That was sudden. Um, <clears throat> but of course, that's just one example. But let's take some other specific examples. So, you know, I speak to one executive said, well, you know, there was so much money to be made in China that we didn't think about anything, you know, we do joint ventures with anybody, we didn't think about any of the politics of it or anything. Well, that those days are past. You know, if you're uh, making semiconductors, there's no chance today that you can set up a factory in China uh, if you're an American company. Um, <clears throat> so the whole multinational model that we saw as a model of efficiency is now a political issue. You know, where do you make your stuff? Where do you import from? Where do you have your supply chains? Um, it's not just a question of business efficiency. It's now a question of political acceptability in, in, in a new geopolitical era. Um, I already mentioned the investment management industry that's, that's you know, under pressure from all sides as to where they invest and where they don't invest. But let's take another couple of very specific examples uh, of individual corporations. So Disney earlier this year uh, ran into two issues. First, they mounted a kind of equality and inclusion and diversity program. You know, who can quarrel with that in principle? Somebody. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and they mounted this program and they mounted it in such a way, uh, in, in a particular way. Well, six months down the road, about 150 of their employees wrote an open letter saying, those of us employees who happen to have uh, conservative and religious views now believe we don't belong anymore in this company. Uh, <clears throat> A couple of years ago, uh, employees essentially forced uh, Google to give up a $10 billion contract over 10 years with the Department of Defense, because in their view, um, they didn't want their AI technology used for defense purposes. Now we can all agree or disagree with that, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it affected them directly. Then you have some companies, and they're rare, that have made political issues a source of competitive advantage. So I take a company like Patagonia that was set up within its DNA as an environmental activist company. So everything that it does is about environmental activism, down to, the, to having tags on their uh, jackets they're trying to sell in their shops, which say, do you really need to buy this jacket? <laughs> um, and having a program that says, you know, don't ever throw anything away, we'll just fix it for free. So here's a company that has built a brand around a political issue, environmental activism. It's whole, not, not all of them, of course, because it's a fashion item too, but a large uh, proportion of its very loyal customer base is there because it is an environmental activist company. 
So very, it, it keeps the keeps their base, uh, their customer base, very loyal. Uh, it organizes events around environmentalism. It puts them in touch with environmental activists, company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a political issue, environmentalism, is actually baked into the DNA of that brand. Now there aren't many companies like that, but I su suggest there will be more and more. You look at companies like. Benetton, a small company called, that I mentioned there, called Tony's Chocolonely. Um, we all know about Nike taking on the Black Lives Matter as part of its uh, promotional campaign. So you can see these, this politicization as being a constraint on business, um, a change in the environment that business has to adapt to, or you can say, well, this offers opportunities. It offers opportunities because in a politicized world, I can create competitive advantage if I'm you know, cleverer than the next guy. So, um, so are, are some of these, so some of the stories are about um, the need to manage uh, reputation uh, in a world where there, each company might be exposed to possibilities of reputational damage because of uh, some employees objecting to the direction things are going in. And others are uh, basically saying, look, politicization in some sense is, is just a fact of life, okay? We're gonna make that the driving force of our strategy, okay? So it's, you're basically saying either way, uh, you have to take this into account in yeah. ways that weren't true before. Yeah, I mean, the world around you is changing and you can't stand still. Um, you can resist it, you can sort of wiggle a little bit, or you can say, well, how do I succeed in this new world? And different businesses will take, you know, different approaches. There's also an issue of the ability to think politically, because there's a, a, a temptation to confuse politics with business ethics. Okay. Uh, now, say more about that. There's there's obviously immense overlap between politics and ethics, but there are. I think it's it's not necessarily right to call this business ethics issue. And let me give you one example. Take the abortion debate in the United States with the repeal of Roe versus Wade. So the abortion debate has splits the population. Okay. There are those who are in favor, those who are against. And both of these groups feel viscerally and strongly that they are morally right. They both feel that they have moral right on their side. And these are irreconcilable positions. There is no way you can get any kind of compromise because it's viscerally held and everybody feels they have, you know, righteousness on their side. So corporations are obviously getting embroiled in this for many reasons, uh, not least because they're being pushed by activists to say something uh, or because they have to decide what they're going to do about their healthcare plans or whatever. Now, if you define this as an ethical question, then you have to come down on one side or another, but you know that in, in your stakeholder groups, there are people with both these views. But the political question is a different one. The political question is, given that we have this rift of, of groups of people with strongly held views that are irreconcilable, what is a reasonable way forward? So you accept the fact that, you know, legitimately people hold different views. That's what politics is about. You know, everybody wants something different. So, you know, how do you find the way forward in a world where everyone wants something different? So you, if you frame the abortion debate as an ethical question, it's difficult. But the political question is quite different. The political question is, okay, people disagree on this. So what is a reasonable way forward? Now, of course, some corporations will take an ethical stance. So a company like Hobby Lobby in the United States, that's a company that wears its Christian credentials 
on its sleeves, just like Patagonia wears its environmental credential on its sleeves, might well say, okay, you know, we have a moral view here and we are on this side of the debate. But most companies, you know, have never been in this debate. <laughs> Um, they've, they've, you know, it doesn't fit with their brand in any way. Their job is to navigate, find a politically acceptable way to navigate this highly emotive subject where you have two opposing groups that can never be reconciled. So do you, yeah, I assume you talk to people run, who run on companies or have done that for a while. Um, how do they, I mean, do they express just general frustration with this? You know, I wish it were, you know, 1950 or something or other, or 1979. Um, unfortunately, I'm here. What do I do? Or they actually have a, a, something of a constructive view of how to, how to lead their organization in this context. Uh, if the latter, you know, are there holes in it that you see? Uh, uh, insights that you appreciate? Uh, give us some benefit. So, of the, so in my experience, um, I mean, obviously, nobody's, everybody's different. <laughs> but in, in my experience, the most overwhelming um, reaction by business to these difficult things, take the abortion debate, which is particularly difficult, so it's useful to use, uh, is you know, why do we have to deal with this? You know, this is not something that I should be having to deal with as a business person. I need to be getting on with doing business. But they know they can't avoid it. Um, and therefore, it's difficult. Um, now, as with every political answer, there is no perfection. You know, it's, it's always messy. You're never going to please everybody, and any answer you, you any anything you decide to put forward is going to be highly imperfect. That too makes people uncomfortable. Business, you know, if you say to them, "There is no perfect answer. This is going to be messy. Doesn't matter what you do." Um, you know, that's not comfortable. The other element is that they're under continuous bombardment by activists from all sides. Um, that's not a comfortable position to be in. And you can't be led by the nose by activists because activists are people by definition, because that's what you need to be to be an activist, an effective activist, who can never be satisfied. Um, so if you start getting led by the nose by activists, you're in trouble. So you need to come up with the best possible approach that fits what your business is about and what you're supposed to. And, and uh, so in the abortion debate, for instance, I think it's perfectly reasonable for people to say, OK, as far as this affects our operations, you know, it affects how we run our healthcare plans. So we've taken this view and this is what we're going to do. And some people are going to howl because whatever you choose, it's going to offend some people. But that is, that's just the way of the world. Um, so, you know, I think everybody's at a learning stage of trying to deal with issues that they haven't had to deal with in the past and for which conventional business tools are not much help. You know, you can't do... You can't do a discounted cash flow analysis on how to deal with the abortion debate. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, these are very fuzzy, qualitative, multiple viewpoint, messy, highly emotive, ever changing issues. That's not usually a comfortable place for business people to be, but they need, they're going to have to learn those skills. So how, how much of, of uh, surviving and thriving in the, new, in the new political capitalism for a business is about managing uh, what might be called reputation? Um, a reputation with the, you know, obviously in the eyes of different groups, mm -hmm. but is, you know, uh, is that the most important thing to manage? I mean, would that be the advice? 
And if so, what what is it that you should be thinking of as the sort of goal of the reputation management? What could you think of as the tools of reputation management? How do you learn about reputation management? I think it's, yes. I think it goes much deeper than reputation. I think it goes to the fundamental question of what is business about? Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about corporate governance. And when I, it's not an area that I have deep expertise in, but when I read about corporate governance, a lot of the discussion is about process. Do you have the right committees? Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you do you have the right process? But I think what this new, if, if my analysis is correct, uh, what, what this new world calls into question is, what are we actually governing for? Now, there used to be a nice, clear, simple, very acceptable, comfortable answer to that. We're governing to maximize shareholder value. Okay? That is eroding, if not already gone. So the question is, what are we governing for? What are, you, what are we in business for? And my view is that business is part of our society, of our, our institutions that have a role in creating a better world. Now, of course, what constitutes a better world is always gonna be contested. But I think if you start looking at business in that way, then the sorts of questions you ask about your business, how you run your business, how you govern your business, what sort of board you have on your business, all that fundamentally changes. So it's not just about managing reputation, it's about, it's about something much more fundamental about why do I exist as a business? What is my role? There's a, there's a story in, um, in the book about years ago, some uh, ex-chairman or CEO, I think it was of DuPont or something, who said, you know, I'd rather be headquartered on some deserted island somewhere where I don't have to be, give account to anybody, where I don't have any regulation or anything, I don't have any politics to deal with, and I can just get on with doing business. Uh, to my mind, that's a kind of sociopathic view of life. <laughs> um, you know, businesses are embedded in our societies and they have a big role and they play a big role in what sort of society we live in. So they are inherently political institutions. So to me, the change that is needed is not simply, you know, how do I pitch this better? Or how do I manage my reputation? It's about rethinking the role of your business <clears throat> in that is the role that is expected of your business in this new world, that society is expecting of your business in this new world. Um, and it's not just your quarterly numbers, but you still have to make your quarterly numbers. And that's the challenge. So it seems to me the uh, kind of theme here is that, um, and, and it comes back to the way you define political capitalism generally is it's, it's a system, not mm -hmm. just in the sense of a machine that's going along, but a bunch, an arrangement of institutions and values and so, so on. And so um, uh, one of the difficulties of the discussion, of course, is that the new political capitalism is meant to be a system that doesn't have all of the elements uh, evident or coming into place. But the contention is that uh, at least one of the little pieces of that system, business, leadership, has got to behave differently, but it's not clear, you know, they can without some other things uh, coming into play. So there may be other parts of the overall system that have to be different for this to work. So pick a few out of the hat. Who has to be doing things differently? Consulting firms, political advisory groups, uh, places like the LSE, you know, what's the message for other people who want to do their part in bringing about the system well, change? Well, certainly other places like the LSE. <laughs> no, I don't know how the LSE does its thing, so I can't, I won't pretend to say, you know, maybe it's perfectly, you know, maybe how the LSE does its business is uh, perfectly fine, but institutions like the LSE, um, 
you know, again, when you, when, if I were to go to a business course here or a finance course here, um, what are the, are the underlying assumptions of that course? You know, I think that we often go in discussions or in teaching settings or whatever and start getting taught certain things and certain underlying assumptions are taken for granted. Like what is business for? Uh, I want to start questioning those foundational assumptions that we've stopped questioning for the last 50 years. Um, <clears throat> so that's, I think, a role that institutions like this uh, can play an important part in. Obviously, there's the public policy side. So how can business adapt and move forward in this direction if our regulatory and public policy system is 20 years behind and ends up disadvantaging businesses that try to move in this direction because the regulation is still for the old world. So, so there's, the, you know, the public policy framework is gonna have to change to encourage you know, to help businesses basically get into this, this, uh, this phase. Um, <clears throat> then there are institutions that are creating the pressures. Um, so, you know, we have a highly active civil society now. Um, nothing is, you know, nothing is secret. I remember 20, 30 years ago, whenever it was, a boss of mine used to say, don't ever put anything in writing that you're not happy for it to appear on the front page of the New York Times. Um, that was prescient. But, you know, now we have incredible amount of transparency. We have a highly active civil society. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're starting to see companies standing up and declaring their values. That's fine. And it's good that you think about them, but before standing up and declaring them, also think about the fact that as soon as you stand up and declaring them, it's an open invitation for act every activist in the world to dig into your business to show that you're not living those values. And how many of us are perfect enough that we can stick, we, that we can you know, stand up to that sort of scrutiny? Uh, <clears throat> so, and there's, con there's customers. You know, in, in the book, I say we should stop thinking of customers as consumers. You know, I think the word consumers needs to be eliminated from the business lexicon because the, the, it, it suggests that the only value of human beings is how much stuff they can buy. Um, so what happens if you stop thinking of your customers as consumers and start thinking of them as citizens? making decisions uh, and maybe thinking of yourself not just as a chief financial officer but actually as a citizen um so you know how would they want you to behave what would they want from your business um so so it's a, it's just a fundamental i believe a quite a fundamentally a fundamental change in how we think about the interaction between all the players in this complex adaptive system. Um, and it'll take time to evolve, but I think this evolution is happening at a much faster pace than we're used to systemic change happening, which is part of the issue of how you adapt to it. Well, I think that's a good moment thank you very much to uh, transition into uh two questions so just to review we have the two audiences right so the the online one is is meant to be busily uh stacking up questions i don't know maybe there's hundreds by now um uh, but we'll start with the present audience um and i think the idea is that you have two ways of communicating you can have the steward come and hand you a microphone or you can just push the little button in front of you when you're called on and uh, open uh, open, open the mic. Uh, and I remind you, it would be helpful if you could say who you are and what your affiliation uh, is, uh, sir. Yeah, you, no, the one who's pointing, you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, so my name is Mike Clark. I run a response investment business called Arrow Advisory. Um, 
it's very difficult when two compulsive contrarians in the room, because I so deeply support Michael's thesis and have come to it a different way. To give an example of the citizen point, when I was a non-exec on an investment company board, our tagline was investing for a world worth living in, which isn't quite sort of Larry Fink's example. So my question is actually one which Larry Fink is going to ask Joe for advice. Because in his last CEO's letter, he said he didn't do politics. I wrote a piece headlined, Larry Fink, broadly right, but on one point spectacularly wrong, which I think Joe would support. So my question goes like this, Joe, I've got all these states saying they're going to fire me, moving money away from mandates because they think I'm woke on climate. I've got all these slower pension funds who are not activists because they've actually got money they're giving me mandates. I know in the long run I've got to do the right thing on climate change. If I do it too soon, I'm going to leave half my American business. How soon can I begin to say what I really believe, which is we need to tackle climate? Or do I need to run two business models for a while? One for all those Republican state pension funds and another for those wise Europeans. What the heck do I do? Yours, Larry. <laughs> well, if, uh, you know, if Larry Fink came to ask me that question, I think you could afford a substantial fee to get an answer, but, <laughs> but anyway. Well, keep away from the detail. But, the, you know, once you get into a political world, there are no clean, easy answers, okay? We, we know the direction the world is moving. Um, and, you know, we might even be able to Im imagine an end state in some kind of abstract sort of fuzzy impressionistic form. The challenge is always how we get from here to there. Um, and we're in a messy situation at the moment. Um, you know, even in the US, different, you know, Larry Fink is under pressure with Texas saying he is gonna be banned from not investing in, um, in oil companies. And in California, telling him you're gonna be banned if you do invest in, in, in oil companies. Um, so there is no magic answer to this, um, but it it's- like there's it, no place to hide. Yes, there, <laughs> there isn't. Um, and, you know, we have to learn how to deal with it. We can't ignore it. Um, he's wrong in saying, I don't do politics, because he does, um, like everybody, uh, like every, every business, and particularly if you're a Black Rock, with such high visibility and such high impact, you know, you, you live in a political world. So, you know, what he does in his operations, I have no idea. Um, but he's got to stop saying I'm out of politics and he's got to start thinking politically. Um, and that will give solutions that will seem imperfect if you look at them from a business perspective, but such is life. Thank you. Yeah, here and then over there. Yeah, I had a few questions, but I'm I'm just going to ask. Do you need to say who I am? Yeah, who I am? I'm a, a, a law student here, masters of law student here. You have so then I've decided which question because I was just contemplating which of my three I'll do a lawyery one. So, as a lawyer, do you have a name? Yeah, Lou Benuso is my name. Um, so I'm not a lawyer yet. Okay. Um, but um, given that the the law still reflects the fact that companies and company directors have a fiduciary duty to ensure profits and for trusts also, when you're doing investments technically legally, you only consider the profit as supposed to. You're you're legally not allowed to have ethical considerations, though it's very difficult to enforce that. To what extent is kind of this new type of political capitalism 
forcing its way into that fiduciary duty because now in order to ensure high profits, you do have to consider political considerations. So our company is really actually moving towards a political capitalism or are they still maintaining a financial capitalism based on making profits but that is but those profits are influenced by the fact that the the level of profits they'll get is influenced by politics so is it really a new model or is it kind of forcing itself into the old model that was already there good question um i don't necessarily think it's an either or it's a, as, as always a messy mix of the two so when the world around you changes then how you're going to be successful and let's put to one side which i'll come to it how we define success how you're going to be successful is by adapting to the world around you so in my view um companies over time will be less successful unless they adopt this different view of what society now expects of them under the definition of fiduciary duty. Um, that it's, it's um, in order to remain successful, in order to keep being profitable and sustainable, then how you approach your business needs to change. Now, will this mean that the businesses of the future can will have lower margins because now a lot of things that were previously externalities will have to be internalized. Well, that's possible. I don't know. Um, but I think the way I like to look at it is the second framing that you have, which is um, the world has changed. For me to remain successful, I have to adapt what I do. So what, fid what fiduciary duty used to mean 20 years ago may not be the same as what it means today. And as you know, this is a subject of intense debate in you know, pension funds, all sorts of uh, investment, investment firms, et cetera. What is my fiduciary duty today? And I can no longer pretend that it's just maximizing shareholder returns. Excuse me. I'm I'm Derek Bates. I'm a writer, and um, and I wanted to say before I say anything more that that's been fascinating. You're speaking so lucidly about the problems which concern me every day. In my view, capitalism is already extremely sick. Um we got to the stage where because of social media we aren't just consumers we're now units of consumption no longer human beings we are manipulated every day um i bought a chair a le corbusier chair my son came to see me and said he liked it his phone listened to him that evening he had an advert for Le Corbusier chair. So people like Amazon are becoming so powerful. They're invading everybody's lives, almost everybody's business. And what we have to have is some way of limiting the power of these multinationals, which are obscenely wealthy. And that's something i haven't read your book so i don't know whether you've dealt with that okay. yes i mean <clears throat> you know everything in the world has its upsides and downsides so you know in the book i describe the book came out it didn't come out actually but was uh, i was stopped from making any further edits <laughs> before facebook changed its name to meta so <laughs> So anyway, it's, uh, I, I make a statement in there that says Facebook, people classify Facebook as a technology company. I classify Facebook as a political corporation because none of us gives a damn 
about the technology that Facebook is using and what kind of algorithms they have and who, you know, what the programming is and what their tech is. But we all care about the impact they're having on our societies. Okay? So Facebook, Google, all these tech giants, these are purely political corporations from my perspective. The technology is just the means. If they could do it by paper and pencil, I don't care. <laughs> um, but the reason that what we care about is their political impact. Um, and, you know, we all understand both the advantages and the disadvantages of social media. You know, social media has given voice. It's, it's part of this pluralist society. It's given voice to a lot of people who never had a voice before. So they've had an important positive impact on how, but you know, the, the, the algorithms and all the issues that, that you mentioned and privacy and, and electoral manipulation and all this sort of stuff, you know, we all know those problems, the echo chambers, we all know those problems too. Um, and regulating this is not straightforward. You know, it's, it's very complicated. There are no perfect solutions. Technology rushes ahead much faster than the regulators can keep up. You know, now we're going to go into the metaverse. I mean, who knows what that's going to bring? Um, you know, my, my uh, prescription, if you like, or my, my plea in the book is we need to have a much more collaborative future between the corporate world and the political and regulatory world. Um, it's past the time that we see these two as being in opposition. Uh, these two need to work together to create something that is useful and that pushes our society forward. Will that happen? I don't know. But it happened in the COVID pandemic. You know, the, the, the collaborative nature between industry and, um, and governments uh, and the regulatory system to tackle the, co the, the, the COVID pandemic was a beautiful sight to behold. <laughs> um, why do we forget it as soon as, as the crisis is over and we go back to this adversarial process? Um, you know, why can't that be a model for how we together create something that can move forward. Um, by hook or by crook, I think we'll get there, uh, but it won't be just like all social progress. It won't be in a straight line. It'll be messy, two steps forward, one step back, three steps sideways, you know, it'll be messy, but that's life. <laughs> So let me take one of the uh, questions from our online uh, audience. Uh, this question is from uh, Tom Abeles in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the question relates pretty much to what you were talking about, an opportunity to say a bit more. Uh, uh, today, government is an integral player in the, in the business arena and might be considered a partner it seems the game can't ignore government sitting at the policy and direction. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's sitting in Minnesota and the, the, the government, government business relations and how they're seen is very cultural. So, you know, in the United States, it's very different from, you know, Germany or Japan or Korea. Um, and there has been a tendency in the United States of saying, you know, government has nothing to do with us. Let's keep it out of the way because it only causes trouble. Um, I think that's changing. Um, and, and I think that, that I don't think we can move forward without a more collaborative relationship. I think this adversarial relationship is far too damaging. Um, but, you know, the likelihood is that we'll have to see a hell of a lot more damage before we adapt, because we're, as human beings, I don't think we're particularly good at avoiding crises, but we're really good at adapting to them. Very good. Come back to the, uh, to the room. Hi, uh, I'm Harish Kolati. I 
primarily uh, consult uh, financial institutions and um, working for them uh, advising them i see a lot of change you know the esg factor the environmental social governance responsibility and lending to the right audience but when we think of the lehman crisis everything went wrong the public perceives at times because of financial institutions in covid everything stopped working except one thing which was the financial institutions which did not let the markets or the world to collapse but to the public give credit to the financial institutions or it's forgotten very soon and the reason i ask is because we are now at this mortgage crisis level so is it being a good citizen as a corporate doing the duty which will drive corporates or do you see some companies actually benefiting from them doing the right thing and that should i believe be the driver of doing the right thing uh, and capitalism wants that sort of an output but would it ever get that sort of an output well it's it's um, interesting about finance and doing the right thing i mean the political way of thinking about it is that what is the right thing is always a contested question um so asking companies to do the right thing doesn't get us very far because if you ask 20 people in this room what is the right thing will be a different thing uh, <clears throat> now we talked a little bit about finance of course we did have the financial crisis it did cause hardship for a lot of people um and the finance sector was not blameless in that but neither were the regulators uh you know this is kind of there's enough blame to go around um but i don't bl personally i don't blame individuals because everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing within how their job has been defined but these are systemic problems um and systems evolve imperfectly so i think the financial crisis was a stimulus for us to rethink certain things um and we have moved in a particular direction is it perfect of course not it will never be perfect uh did we move back you know having moved forward three steps did we move back two of course we did um but people are always looking to blame someone and you know finances and financial institutions are a very attractive uh, <laughs> uh you know group to blame um and as i mentioned earlier finance and the people who deal in finance is an essential part it's the lifeblood of our economy but everything collapses if you take it too far um and i think with fin with financialization things have you know the system that brought quite a lot of benefits was simply taken too far it's now come to the end of its of how far we can stretch it so i think now is the time that you know a new system a new way of thinking has to evolve and i think we're seeing it as you mentioned with esg and all this sort of thing it'll take time to adapt we might have one or two crises in the meantime i don't know uh, we've nearly had a pension crisis you know last week um uh so and and you know there's something else i was discussing in a financialized world i mean take take things like carbon credits and all these derivatives financial derivatives around carbon you know there's a question there as to whether the motivation is really to remove carbon or, or to to reduce to reduce co2 pollution or whether the motivation is to create financial instruments that can be traded and on which we can make short term profits and who cares about the carbon <laughs> those are the sorts of questions that financialization raises Okay, one, uh, we have one time for one question over there, please. Uh, Kevin Langford, I'm a, I'm a, a member of uh, Radix, so my, my background is in, in, in business. Um, Joe, do you think that the world you're describing will have a, have organizations, particularly public organizations, with a much wider set 
of different objectives and that these objectives will be much more explicit in you know this corporation is doing this particular set of political uh, um, um, has this particular set of political business organizational objectives so that everybody know everybody joining that corporation investing in that corporation knows where they where they where they are mm. um <clears throat> who knows <laughs> Uh, you know, the reality is, and that's that's the beauty of a pluralistic market society, is that lots of businesses will try lots of different things. Um, you know, and we now have social enterprises, we have B corporations, um, you know, we have all sorts of innovations in in types of companies and the reason why they see themselves in business. So, and that's part of how the system will evolve. So people will try different things. Others will see that doing it this way may be more successful, so they'll follow. Um, but it'll be an evolutionary, an evolutionary process in a pluralistic system. Um, you know, there's no such thing as business. There are just millions and millions of businesses doing their work run by, you know, billions of people doing different things um, and that's how the system uh, will evolve um, so i think the answer to your question is no doubt we will see some businesses like that um, but we will see others who are not like that and we'll have to see which ones end up being the most successful and over what period because a lot of this is a question of dis deciding over what period of time you're defining success. You know, if you're defining success as an investment, as an investor, if you've got a pension fund with a, with a time horizon of 70 years, um, your decisions are fundamentally different from someone who says, you know, I'm a short-term trader and I'm just interested in making a ton of money over the next five years and retiring. You know, that, that gives you a fundamentally different outlook on life. Um, so, you know, there'll be all sorts and we'll just see some will be more successful than others. They will be copied. Others, like always, will just go out of business. Um, but there, there won't be a model, uh, I hope, because otherwise it's a nightmare if there's only one model. Okay, thank you um, uh, very much. I think a couple of uh, conclusions then uh, would be that the new poli political capitalism will be easier to retrodict uh, 30 years in the future than it is to predict today. <laughs> it seems to be a, a major line. Uh, um, and as for how businesses and societies can thrive in a deeply politicized world, um, the main answer is maybe, uh, but in many different ways. For sure, and it would be very. Uh, um, I mean, we will be able to see systems change better in retrospect, and we won't really know what will count in the meantime. Although some have said <laughs> that even the past is uncertain. Uh, yes, it's too. Yes, it's it's. Uh, yes, well, what do you think of the French Revolution? It's too, <laughs> too early to tell. Uh, but one thing we can tell is that we're out of time, and so I'd like to thank our speaker and guest, uh, Jose Lucia. Thank you, everybody who came. Uh, today. Thank you for the Department of Economics for organizing uh, the event. Uh, I will remind you that the book signing um, opportunity lies ahead of you just outside uh, the room. Uh, Joe is uh, talking about the new political capitalism. You can find out more on the event listing. More events to come soon. Thank you and good evening.